but what I've over time started to realize also is like, and it goes back to kind of uh, why we want to start so many of these companies. Investing in other people's companies is great. And obviously the power law takes over. And when that occurs, uh, it's an amazing and angel investing can be really profitable. But actually you're much more likely to be able to take, you know, fifty, hundred thousand dollars start a business and get to like a million dollars in revenue and throw off 500 to $700,000 in profit year after year after year and do it with like a very high degree of, uh, of uh, probability of success. And so in some way, like what's better than angel investing in other people's ideas? It may actually be just like angel investing in your own ideas or your own companies. And so that's really where I've been focused is like, Yes, I will still on occasion invest in other companies, but now I want to start these businesses. And I look at it as what is the competitive advantage? We have capital, but we also have distribution. And so if you have capital and distribution, you basically just need like a decent idea and you need an absolute killer operator. And if you can find those two things, combine it with the capital and distribution, you got a good chance of being able to make some money. All right, we got an episode here with Pomp, Anthony Pompliano, who you may know as the Bitcoin guy. He's huge all over YouTube, Twitter, everywhere else. He uh, came on. We're actually going to do this as a two-part episode because at the beginning, it was all business. We were business in the front. We were talking about this crazy million-dollar Bology bet where he's betting that Bitcoin is going to a million dollars in the next 90 days. We talk about that, why Bology thinks it, what we think about the bet, and Pomp does a, you know, I don't know. Econ 101, where he explains what's going on with the banking system from his perspective. That was good. And but here's the, the thing, half, though. In that episode, the whole episode is about something that's going to happen inside the next 90 days. So if you're going to like, it is a little fearful listening to it. And so actually listen to the whole thing because and do it now because we're talking about something that's happening in 90 days. And then go ahead. The second episode was way more fun. And it was pretty wild. Go ahead. We talk about his business empire, you know, what he's building and why he's building it that way, why he gave back all the money from his fund and shut that down, why he huge turned off all his advertisers, millions of dollars of advertisers, what he's doing instead. So we talked about that. And then we talked about it. Then it went off the wall and uh, the, the pod got a little crazy, but in a great way. I think people are going to you're going to love part two. He broke down like all of his businesses and how they work. It's very impressive. It, it was pretty wild. Um, and uh, it was, it was, he's, he's impressive. He's significantly more impressive than a lot of people think, I think, because there's and way more behind the scenes. Pretty funny stories, which Pomp is usually, he's pretty buttoned up on his, on his main channel because he's talking finance, he's talking serious, but he tells some pretty funny stories. So the second uh, part two is the more fun episode. Part one is the more serious episode. I think you'll like them both. And we have to remind you guys that our episodes, we work, really, really hard. And unlike every other type of podcast out there, our stuff's not free, but you don't pay with money. All you have to do is go to our YouTube page. We call this the gentleman's agreement. What is it? The ladies understanding. The ladies you understanding. Go our, you go to our YouTube page. And the reason it's called that is because it's an understanding. It's an agreement. We can't be there behind your screen to check this. Otherwise we would, but everyone's doing it. So just go ahead and do it and click subscribe on YouTube. And then just go ahead and do that on Spotify and iTunes because the more you do that, the more our volume goes up and we get more downloads and we could do keep doing this type of stuff. Pomp ain't going to come on to episodes like this if, if we don't have a big listenership. Same with all the other guests. All right. Enjoy. Can we talk about instead of value uh, ruining, we talk about value creation because <laughs> Pomp owns like four companies, I think, that I wanted to ask him about. And my um, fight or flight mode is like too much right now that I need like. I need like a rags or riches story. I need something interesting. I need I need Pomp to tell me how he makes makes the paper now because I, I need to calm down. I need to meditate by <laughs> Pomp telling me how he makes income. <laughs> um, Is so, that all right, Sean? Yeah, but, but, but how, what's your question? How do you want to frame it? Well, so Pomp, he has, from what I understand, you have four or five different companies and you have this office in Miami and you have like, it feels like you have, at first I was going to call it a mini empire, but it doesn't sound so mini at, at, actually. Uh, it sounds Medi medium like Medium empire? Are, medium empire. Yeah. Uh, maybe big empire. I don't know. Can you explain what are like the things that you got going on? Yeah. So, you know, from my career, uh, if you really think about, there's kind of three stages to some degree. At first it was like, hey, how do I build companies? And I basically had enough success where it was like, okay, maybe I'm not like, horrible at this, but I definitely don't know how to like 
build companies to scale, et cetera. Uh, that led to uh, Facebook where like, that was kind of my equivalent of like an MBA, right? I literally was with all these super talented people uh, in 2014, 2015. Um, I was put on a number of different projects where uh, I got exposed to Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg and a bunch of the leadership of the, the company. And I just learned a lot. It was like the best learning experience possible. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, I started investing. And when I started investing, it was kind of like, I didn't have an idea to start a company. So like, oh, let's try this investing thing. And I really enjoyed doing it. Uh, ended up building two different asset management firms. Um, and like, it's fun, but like the product is kind of money and you get to work on a bunch of different ideas. But I think that I keep coming back to, uh, an idea of like venture capital is such a slugging percentage game that what you end up doing is you end up actually playing an access game almost more than you do playing a business game. And what I mean by that is outside of the, maybe the big five or six venture capital funds, once a company gets de-risked, it is all access, right? It is literally, who do you know? How do you get into a deal? How do you actually get an allocation, whatever? And like, that's fun. But that to me is more of like a uh, kind of a status type thing of like, oh, what do these people think of me? Will they invite me into the deal? And like that maybe is like an underbelly of the venture capital industry. And so simultaneous to building those asset management firms, I started creating content on the internet. And in hindsight, like it was optimized initially for learning. Then it kind of switched like, oh, there's a lot of deal flow that comes from this. And so I like took it a little bit more seriously. And then there was this like final transition to like, oh, these are like businesses, right? And I think the big aha that I had was, Historically, you built a company by building the product and then going and looking for customers. Now you can find the customers and then build the product. And so that's essentially what we've done is we've built this very, very large audience. Um, you know, the podcast is 25 million downloads last year. YouTube's half a million subscribers. Uh, one day, you, I think you guys are going to pass me, so keep going. Uh, the email is big. Twitter's big, et cetera. And is your podcast, is, are you bigger than us right now? Are you trying to flex on us or are we already bigger? I think you're many, still bigger. How many downloads? Uh, ranges from a hundred thousand to one hundred fifty thousand per episode, and if that's uh, so, the the RSS feed, the actual pod, is in the hundred thousand ish range, sometimes more, sometimes less, and then the YouTube videos, twenty to fifty thousand. So that's why we say hundred to one hundred fifty thousand downloads. So per you episode. guys will do more than me on individual episodes, but I have like this crazy power law. Like we just put up an interview on YouTube; it's got you know hundred thousand views in the first twelve uh, hours, right? So it's like very much concentrated on like the long tail. Um, which is like also interesting, right? Like, would you rather have the consistent 50 to hundred thousand YouTube and, and podcast, or would you rather have the breakout like million, you know, views plus every month or so? Like, the, yeah. So you may, maybe, maybe you'll catch up to us one day. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so the general idea has just been like, how do you build those businesses? Um, and really it's like, once you know who the audience is, you can go and build products. But like, I very much look at it as a game and it goes back to the whole idea of like, I don't have hobbies, right? Like this is what I do uh, in my free time and I really enjoy doing it. And so we've built a number of different businesses. Some of them have been bigger than others. Uh, but really it's like, if you have distribution, then you can build companies in the 21st century. And we see, you know, really, really big creators doing this. I tend to think of anyone can do it. Um, and then well, I guess- the, What are the businesses? Uh, so there's the media company itself. Uh, then we have a, uh, with two asset you, 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 well, you have at, you have at, so yeah, let's just listen. So number one, media company that right. has, ad, that has advertising. Is that a substantial size business? It used to have advertising. It was a very substantial business. Uh, it probably was one of the best monetized podcasts in the world based on the audience to, to revenue. Uh, it, it was a big podcast. And so both on the revenue side and also the, the downloads, um, I turned all the ads off and I think there was really two things that fed into it. One was when you have an advertiser, usually you just go and you find companies that you like their product. You then say, Hey, I use this product. You guys should check it out. And that's like, fine. If you're doing like a bar of soap or you're doing like liquid death or, you know, like wh whatever the, the normal product is, the problem in finance is like people put their money into a product that you then share. And so you're essentially like renting your reputation to someone else right? And you have no control over the business. You don't know what they're doing. And then it's not like, oh, I bought this, you know, chair that got recommended, or I bought this sweatshirt that uh, Sean and Sam said was really cool. I don't like it. Like, ah, the idiots, right? But like, I'm not that worried about it. When somebody puts their money into a product, then all of a sudden 
it, it's a whole different game. And so I just didn't want to be in that world anymore, especially when a lot of them are crypto companies and crypto companies kept blowing up, et cetera. But the second thing that I realized from a business opportunity standpoint is when I got rid of all of the advertising, I knew that we would take a massive hit. We have a team, we've got an office, like all this stuff. And so I had to commit to personally covering everything. So like once I made the decision, I've been losing money every month, but I'm doing it because the bigger opportunity is to actually own the products and services that you put through the distribution. So think of it like you guys will get paid as a podcast host for an ad. They might pay you $1 to read the ad, but they're making three to $5 on the back end as their return on advertising. Now, if you can cut out the middleman and you can just own the product or service, that's a way better deal. The reason why most people don't do it is because they don't have the skill set or the interest in actually building the product or the service. And so I basically just was like, look, we kind of like figured out how to do advertising based content. I want a hard challenge. I want to do something that is going to be by most people's account, stupid to give up all this revenue and go try this. Um, and like, it's one intellectually stimulating, but two is if we figure it out, it'll be a way bigger business and it'll be a much more sustainable, resilient thing over the long run. It's just, you gotta be able to weather the kind of bumpy transition in between ad based to, you know, owning the products and services yourself. So we have fund, we have media company, which sometimes does, sometimes doesn't actually make revenue. Then we well, have- Hold on, hold on. The fund, didn't you give all the money back? Aren't you no longer in the fund? So there's two different asset management firms. One was a uh, joint venture with uh, Morgan Creek Capital, a, a hedge fund. Um, we invested all the capital uh, and uh, um, you know, See, invested in companies that. like Coinbase and uh, we bought some Bitcoin, those types of things. Uh, and you and then, get a cut if it ever does well. Correct. And then um, I had a second asset management firm. I was one of the first people to do a rolling fund on AngelList, which I found was an incredible product for somebody who has a small team and, and kind of wants to punch above their weight. Um, and so I, I think we grew it into like maybe the third biggest uh, rolling fund on the platform at the time, um, made a bunch of investments. And then I just got to the point where I started to do the math. And I was like, what do I enjoy investing in? I enjoy investing in like the pre-seed seed. I actually don't like doing like series B, series C stuff again, because it's more of like this like status and access game. I enjoy meeting someone who's like, I have an idea and like talking to them and trying to figure out like, is this a viable idea? What are the first steps? And so if you actually look at the math, if you can afford to personally invest in those deals, a lot of times it's actually better economically to personally invest than it is to invest out of the fund because of the way that the carry works and, and kind of the management fees, et cetera. And so it was like, if I invest personally rather than do the fund, and also now I don't have to spend time on LPs, on the updates, like do all the things that go into managing a fund, I get time back plus I could make more money. Like I'll always pick that. And so I gave back all of the uninvested capital out of that fund and then now just do all of my investing personally. And do you do big checks or is it like the normal like fifteen to thirty thousand dollar angel check? No, I'll do bigger than that. Um, but what I've over time started to realize also is like, and it goes back to kind of uh why we want to start so many of these companies. Investing in other people's companies is great. And obviously the power law takes over and when that occurs, uh, it's an amazing and angel investing can be really profitable, but actually you're much more likely to be able to take, you know, 50, hundred thousand dollars, start a business and get to like a million dollars in revenue and throw off 500 to $700,000 in profit year after year after year and do it with like a very high degree of, uh, of, uh, probability of success. And so in some way, like what's better than angel investing in other people's ideas it may actually be just like angel investing in your own ideas or your own companies. And so that's really where I've been focused is like, yes, I will still on occasion invest in other companies, but now I wanna start these businesses. And I look at it as what is the competitive advantage? We have capital, but we also have distribution. And so if you have capital and distribution, you basically just need like a decent idea and you need an absolute killer operator. And if you can find those two things, combine it with the capital and distribution, you got a good chance of being able to make some money. And so you have, um, and by the way, what's your biggest angel investment or what, what will end up be so far the most successful one you think? Um, some of the big, I mean, Bitcoin obviously is probably the one that uh, will end up making the most money, uh, both in terms of the amount of money I invested, but also uh, uh, kind of just the aggregate dollar uh, value it'll be worth. I would tend to be in Sean's camp, like the dollars aren't gonna matter, it's just gonna be the Bitcoin. Um, I think that some that people will find interesting, I don't know the exact math on all of them. And, and one of the things is when it's your own money, you probably pay less attention than when it's a fund, right? Cause you're kind of just like, oh, I invested, that money's gone. Uh, hopefully I get some back later. 
Um, but I invested in Varda, uh, Delian, and a bunch of those guys. Um, they're doing kind of uh, space manufacturing. I find that really fascinating. Um, a friend and I, it, uh, we invested in something called Everly Well, uh, based out of Austin, actually. Uh, they do like at-home diagnostic testing. Um, I invested in uh, Howard Lerman's new company, Rome. Uh, they're kind of building like a, a workspace for remote teams, kind of a Zoom and Slack type killer that seems to be doing uh, very, very well, um, and a whole host of other ones. So, all right. So we're, and then you've got, so you got the fun and investing, you got that thing, media company. You also have Crypto Academy. You have Crypto Jobs, which parlayed now into like a proper recruiting service. Yeah. Are those three. So you can basically think of uh, the Inflection Points business, a business called Inflection Points. Um, you can think of that almost as like, it's become a holding company for all these different products and services in a specific vertical. So I'm fascinated with Mark Leonard. I don't know if you guys know uh, Constellation Software. He basically buys these like vertically, uh, uh, vertical specific software companies. Um, well, what happens if you don't have a, a holding company that ends up buying across the different verticals. What if you just have a holding company within a specific vertical? And so that's basically what we've built. We have a job marketplace that companies can go list their open roles. They pay for it. We then use the distribution to drive traffic. People uh, can go get a job. We also have- And a that's, uh, that's popcryptojobs.com, right? That's that site? Correct. Okay. Correct. And, th and that, that's like a pretty basic business. It's just a job board. Think of a job board, right? That's how we got started. It was just a job board. Got it. We launched it. It got to like $50,000 in monthly revenue, pretty much in like the first like four weeks. Uh, and it was like, okay, we have a business here, right? We can go and we can try to scale this thing. Um, we then bought a recruiting company, kind of traditional headhunters, uh, proof of talent is the name of that business. Um, and so you can do like self-serve, you can go and list the jobs and people will come to you, or you can go and you can work with the recruiters. They just take a percentage of the first year uh, fee. Then we started doing corporate training. So there was a very large company that came to us and was like, Hey, can you train our people? Um, and so we got into that business, uh, ended up growing that to seven figures in revenue. Um, and then we just started a research business, the research business, think of it as like buy side research. So, uh, you pay a subscription fee, um, and they deliver research, uh, kind of a couple times a week, uh, called reflex. Can you say what that's, yeah, can you say what that was called? So that one's like, that, that one's like a perfect example, right? So reflexivity research is within that holding company, but I think is a perfect example of like what I want to do now over and over and over again. Uh, so if you have an idea, please reach out to myself, uh, Sam or Sean, but, um, Will Clemente is a, uh, a young guy in the Bitcoin crypto world, uh, has done really great analysis. I've worked with him for about a year. I know that he's hardworking. How did you find that, that guy? He was like in college, right? When you found him? That guy was great. He was working at that Target. Was, he was working at Target, literally? He was literally working at Target and he would oh, go into the This bathroom. story can end either way. This is going to end <laughs> wonderfully or not. I mean, the, the, so the, the leading Bitcoin researcher was working at Target uh, all right. This is either a great underdog story or it's going to be, how could you guys trust this guy? <laughs> so, so, so I don't remember every single detail, but he had like, I don't know, a couple thousand, maybe a thousand followers on Twitter. He was going into the bathroom at Target and like tweeting like Bitcoin charts and stuff. And so I met him because of the stuff he was tweeting and then was in the like, bathroom. <laughs> no, online. <laughs> and I started hey. being like, Hey, you know, like, what's your background? What do you do? Like, also, and he's like, like, I'm literally like, in the bathroom at Target tweeting on my lunch break, right? Or whatever. I was like, all right, like that's pretty cool. Um, and so we just started to, you know, kind of uh, interact online. Then I started to bring him on the podcast and just like, I got to know him and it was like, okay, like this kid is smart. Uh, he's young, so he doesn't have a ton of experience, but like his compounding uh, rate of learning was like off the charts. He would like read a book in two or three days and then like send me, hey, here's all the things I learned from the book. And then you'd like read another one and do it again. And it was just like, all right, the trajectory of this is not linear. This is very much like compounding or exponential. Like this is a By young way, person that I want to spend time with. Why is a guy who's this smart at this into learning working at Target in the first place? Like, was he just not interested in school, but only interested in blockchain? What, why does this happen? Well, he was in college. He, this was like his like job while he was in college gotcha. was like, you just go to like the local businesses, right? And he got a job at Target. Cool. So he ended up dropping out of college and kind of like bet on himself. He got a job. Eventually we're like, hey, maybe we should like start a company together. And so we figured out kind of the structure of the business. Um, we put some money into the business and we, in the first six months, got to, you know, 100K of ARR. And I think that we will be at maybe three or 400K of ARR after the first, you know, call it nine months. And then I think that maybe we can get somewhere around a million dollars in the first year. And so it's like, if you can do and this product, by, by the way, this product, I'm looking at the site. So it, I, I used to own this thing called Trends, Trends.co. And we got that to be a good business, but you guys are doing very similar, but you're making not, I made the mistake of being broad. You're doing just crypto. It's $2,500 a year. 
And what is it, just a weekly newsletter? No, you get like anywhere between four to six different research reports per week. And then there's a weekly, what we call like an analyst call. So we've got a bunch of these young people who are like crypto native kids, right? I'll, I'll use kids because they're like under the age of 25, most of them. Uh, and they're super, super smart. They're like in all the Discord channels and, and they really understand like what is happening in the community. And then you take someone like me who can help them wrap that into something that can be consumed by <laughs> large family offices, hedge funds, you know, large asset managers, individual investors, et cetera. And so not only do you get the research reports, but you also get that weekly call where uh, you get to get on and just ask them questions. So like, and um, they're, and they're, so, they're writing the report. Yeah, Jason here Correct. from JP Morgan. Um, just quick question for uh, come squat 69. Uh, you, you mentioned that you were would love to hear you expand on that. And also whoever's vaping, can you please, uh, mute, yeah. mute the microphone? Yeah. They just call everyone bra. Like, sub bra. Uh, yeah, it's we, good. We literally, we, we literally have like public company CEOs who are subscribers and they get on the call and they're like trying to like, you know, learn and all this stuff. And, uh, when you have these businesses, I think that there, there's like pros and cons to these like internet uh, native businesses that are started, especially with young people who want to work, who, who kind of have this desire to kind of push forward. The good thing is like, they're young. They're like too naive to know all the things that would stop somebody else from doing it. They have a lot of time on their hands. And like, frankly, they're willing to make mistakes, right? They don't get embarrassed because they did something. You're just like, hey, don't do that. And they're like, okay, like, thanks. And they just go and do something else. The downside to it is like, at one point, we literally had to have like a little bit of an internal session on like, hey, here's how you write, you know, like like grammar and like, here's how to like use punctuation and spacing and like all these types of things. And so you go into these businesses understanding that like, it's all about momentum. And then you have to look for the rate of, uh, or the compounding rate of learning. And if you can set it up correctly, these businesses can grow to be pretty substantial. They can be profitable. And also the thing I enjoy the most is like, if I could go back and be 22 again, like I don't want to go get a fucking job, right? I want to like kind of bet on myself and use this internet thing and try to make money and make more money than I could make at a regular job. And so in many of our different businesses, we have people who have made enormous amounts of money compared to what they could make if they went and got a normal job doing the exact same skill, but it's all comes down to incentives. And so in every business, what I try to do is I try to create upside where we take a portion of revenue or profit, depending on the business, we put it into a pool and then we try to split that among the team. And so if you have a profitable business and you're able to incentivize people and you're like, Hey, when you win, I win. And when I win, you win, people will do incredible quality and velocity of work because ultimately the capitalistic incentive takes over and they just simply want to make money and they want to do good work to make that money. And so it ends up aligning interest and these businesses can absolutely explode. But why do five things instead of just one thing that, that could maybe like just grow a little bit faster or have more of your focus? I am doing one thing. So I think this is like a, a different way of looking at it. I'm providing capital and distribution. That's the only thing I do, right? When I start the research business, Will and the people he has hired, they're doing the research. They're doing kind of all the different things. I'm really, really good at putting together the deals and the capital and then pushing a high quality product through my distribution. And hopefully that'll grow to not just be my distribution, be other people's distribution. But I couldn't run the recruiting business. I couldn't run the research business. I couldn't run, you know, a lot of these different businesses. I have to kind of stay within that circle of competence. And it's just like provide capital, have a huge megaphone, and I guess maybe pick correctly, right? Pick the people that you're going to do it with correctly. And then just like get out of the way and let them be great at what they do. And if you have the stars align, like they can become pretty big businesses. Sean and I are kind of in like a similar spot as you. And the thing I keep asking myself is like, yeah, this is awesome. Uh, we, you know, and Sean and I each separately are doing very similar to things as you. But I think to myself, but when are people going to stop listening to me? When, when, when am I not going to be cool anymore? Do, does that, do you get that fear of like, uh, your clout won't matter? Well, I, I think that I've now been on the internet long enough where like I've gone through peaks and valleys. Like 2021, I could have literally tweeted sup and it was going mega viral during like the Bitcoin bull market, right? Like literally I could just breathe on the internet. Everything went viral, but like, that's not me. And you have to be grounded enough to understand like that's Bitcoin bull market, you know, uh, product. That's not cause I'm some genius. Now when that stuff crashes, you know, I have this saying of like, if you get the praise on the way up, you got to eat the shit on the chin on the way down. And so like, you naturally, and you've, eaten, you've eaten a lot of shit. 
because right. you're you're so charismatic and you make all these bold claims. I mean, you get a lot of crap. Yeah, but like if you view that from the perspective of like these people are attacking me, like you'll be super depressed and you'll like run away and, and be quiet. And a lot of people do that. When the Bitcoin, you know, bear markets come or other asset markets come, like there are people who just disappear, right? Instead, I look at those opportunities as kind of a defiant way to say like, it does not matter what happens, I'm not leaving. And so, you know, in this last one, when FTX blew up and all this stuff happened, I went on national television and was grilled by a, a reporter for 20 minutes and in a completely unscripted thing. And he, like, he wasn't friendly, but it, to me, like that's where my skill set shines is like, I will debate anyone at any time on topics that I think I understand. And it's even better if it's on live TV, because guess what we did? I went on television. I did it. I got off. Twitter was like on fire. People were like, that was the greatest segment of all time. These two guys just went at it. And I emailed them and I said, send me the video. I took the video and immediately uploaded it to YouTube, the full thing. And I said, title, Pomp Destroys TV Host on Bitcoin. <laughs> and published it. <laughs> right? And so like, why go on television? It's to get the clips, to get the content, to then post on your own stuff, right? So I, I think that the hate, you have to also realize like, Oh, like that's the president of my marketing team. That guy, there's a guy yesterday, true story, who created an entire thread of hate. He had videos, he had tweets. He literally filmed himself unfollowing me, right? Like he filmed his phone, screen record, unfollowing me. And I almost DM'd him and said, thank you, right? But I was just like, dude, do you not understand how the internet works? The more you attack people, the bigger the audience gets. And I don't want to be attacked. Like I'm not seeking controversy. I'm not seeking to be attacked. But what ends up happening is if you have that view of that lens, the haters are actually on your team. They just haven't realized it yet. And so like, let them do their thing, let them keep hating. And naturally the audience gets bigger and bigger over time. What distribution channel is going to be the most effective to you? And the one that you're, when, when you talk about this distribution, and if you only had one of them, let's say Twitter, email list, podcast, mm -hmm. YouTube, which one would you say this is the most powerful and this is the one I'm focused on growing? So the one that I wouldn't give up is the email. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that's the one I'm most focused on growing. I think that audio is a really interesting medium where you're basically whispering in someone's ear for like an hour, like it's super intimate and people really come to trust you and things like that. And so I think there's probably someone out there like just doing reps at, at the gym and just grunting right now and <laughs> listening to us right now. We, yeah. we get that a lot. So you're we're in people's ears as they're bench pressing. I mean, somebody's bicep curling right now, but also someone's like literally at the bottom in their deep squat. And they're like, damn, <laughs> these guys <laughs> they are calling me out right now, right? But like, you're, you're basically just, uh, you're in people's ears or in email, you have direct communication and also you can write. Like if you understand what your best quality is, some people it's writing, some people it is video, some people it's just audio and talking. I know people who have podcasts who script out every single word of the episode. I don't think you guys do that. Right. And like, if you guys did do that, one, it would take you guys forever, but also two, like it wouldn't be as entertaining. It wouldn't be as fun. And so it's kind of trying to figure out like, what is the match between like the participant and the medium? So like, if you guys were sending an email and like you two wrote it, you didn't hire anyone like, sorry, but it'd probably be suck. Right. It would just be like, ah, eh, there's no magic here because actually what makes this so magic is that like, there's the serendipity and the like iterative nature that you guys have back and forth. And so I just think that as people start to get onto the internet and try to build these audiences, you got to really question like, where is my advantage and where do I actually have something that can cut through the noise? Because now there's so much noise. If you don't cut through, then you might as well not get started. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history, calls, support tickets, emails, and... Here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm just exhausted. <laughs> I hate when you end the, end the episodes that way. You, you, I just like that's how I feel because like imagine imagine watching a TV show and they're they're putting on a show they're trying to have a good time and at the end they're like fuck man <laughs> you'd be like Whoa. I just feel like I just he's got down like, I'm down Sam you I'm are not a, down a, a, you're a you're a, a you, people will follow your lead if you had a good time no. they'll have a good time you you gotta I'm have down some, as we say showmanship. A showman wouldn't be tired at the end of his episode. 
dude i'm not down i'm amped and it's like i got to go with like it's like it's like i just got done working out i gotta go like rest for a minute and then get up and like implement all this stuff i feel like uh, i need to go and like I, I, I maybe I'm into crypto now. I don't know. I like he, he's just Malcolm Gladwell, my ass. Like I right. just I just got got, you know, like I just feel good about like what I heard. And uh, you, you're just you're full of energy. Do you nap? No. Are you a napper? <laughs> no. You don't nap? No, hell no. Why would you nap? You don't nap? Shit to do. Oh, dude, I'm team I, nap I, over I, here. Nap is yeah, the I take a 30 minute nap every day. <laughs> do you guys both take naps for real? Yeah. I nap every oh, other day. Since 99. I'm trying to shoot every for day. every day. Once I get to every day, I know I've made it. How many hours do you guys sleep at night? Seven. Normal. Same. Oh, man. I don't think I could nap during the day, but I also drink uh, coffee in the morning, so like that might screw it up too. I, I got to tell you guys a hilarious story uh, before we go. So, so Pump was talking about his like analyst team is like, you know, the, the, the high quality analyst team that's all like, you know, uh, you know, two years out of, out of undergrad. And, uh, we at Milk Road, we basically had a super lean team. It was me, Ben, but I wasn't active day to day, really. I was, you know, just kind of guiding. Um, ben was running it. And then there was a, our, our lead writer, Diego, who's awesome. And then we hired one guy. We were like, maybe we should do social media. And so we put out a thing being like, hey, um, I don't know how to use TikTok, but if you do, come work for us. And so this guy, Billy, uploaded this incredible video. It's on the it's on the internet. You can go go look on Twitter. But basically, he uploaded this video milk. of him just chugging milk shirtless and just like doing, it was just like a ridiculous video. He's like, he would find somebody be like, hey, can you hold this phone? I'm trying to get a job. And then he would chug the milk and they'd be like, a job? What is this? And so anyways, we hired Billy. We tried to do the TikTok thing. It didn't fully work out, but it was okay. Uh, but Billy's, Billy's a great guy. He helped, ended up helping write the newsletter. So two hilarious things just happened. First, they did a Milk Road team offsite, like something we never did because my whole ethos building the Milk Road was like, I'm not trying to be a CEO anymore. Like, I'm not trying to like stand up in front of the company with a t-shirt with our name on it and tell everybody how great everything is. Like, I just don't want to even have to do all that stuff. But the, the new guys who bought it, they want to do the company building. So they invited everybody out. And uh, I asked Ben, I go, how was the offsite? And he goes, he had one, one insight from the whole thing. He goes, Billy showed up in a wife beater. But not as a joke. He just said, that's just how, what he wore to the event. And no one said anything. And I was like, no one said anything? I go, wow, that's incredible. I can't imagine not saying anything. And then let's fast forward three weeks. Uh, Billy, Billy, they offered Billy a raise and he quit instead. And I was like, and so Ben goes, Billy, you, you got a raise and you quit? Like this guy's a conundrum, man. What, what's going on? He goes, he goes, he goes, you quit. Like, what's, what's the plan? And he just replied to Ben in a text message. He goes, do I look like a guy with a plan? <laughs> <laughs> and that became the most badass thing I've heard all week. Do I look like a guy with a plan? <laughs> but Sean, I, I tend to think that we over index a lot on like, uh, people want to always hang out with their heroes, right? They want to hang out with the older people. They want to hang out with the people who have done the thing that they are trying to do. And there's a lot of value you can get from that. But I do think that we drastically under index on like, go find the young energetic person who you're like, you are literally an idiot, but damn, are you going to be an awesome idiot who's going to run right. through 20 walls and eventually find something on the other side? And what it does is it like, it forces you to up your game. Like, have you ever talked to like a 21 year old and you're like, okay, so uh, uh, let's get this done by Wednesday. And they're like, okay. And then they send it back to you like two hours later. And you're right. like, damn, why do we wait till Wednesday? Like this kid is actually correct. We should just get it done now. And so I do think that the internet companies or these native companies, that's one of the big advantages they have. Like, I, you know, you guys had uh, Nick Huber, you've had Andrew Wilkinson, like a, a bunch of people who are doing this. When you find the right person who can just like get shit done, you are unstoppable with the internet now. And I think that that is something that more and more people are going to wake up to. And like, it wouldn't surprise me if we like bankrupt Main Street businesses because they all move online as people just realize like, why am I going to have like a physical store that people have to walk into when I can just do this online thing? And it is a big concern for these local communities, but at the same time, like there's way more economic opportunity online for, uh, for people who want to do that. One of the other guys we tried to hire at Milk Road, he was a young guy, 20, 21 years old. He was working at Main Street at the time. And I love this guy's tweets. I thought he was interesting. And he would tweet out these like little random websites he was making on the weekend that were like just super simple like kind of like, it's either going to go viral or this is the dumbest thing ever, 
Uh, there's no in between. There was no like kind of core product service. It, it made no sense. Nothing he did made any sense. And I was like, dude, I love this guy. So I told Ben, I was like, hey, we should hire this guy. He's like, what's he going to do? I go, I don't know. We should just have him do what he's doing now, but without his full time job. Like, what if we just gave him more time to do the stupid shit he's doing on the weekends, Monday through Friday instead? And so an I talked dog. to him. He'll figure it out. I talked to him and I was like, hey, uh, you know, here, dude, I think this Milk Road thing's going to work. It was super early. We were like, I don't know, four weeks into it or something. And I was like, I think this thing's going to work. You should join. He's like, same thing. What am I going to do? I go, just do 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 weird, uh, you know, Rohan stuff that you do. Go, just go ahead and do that. And um, he's like, all right, cool. Let, let me, let me, like, let me, give, let me hit you up. Uh, he's like, he's like, when do you want to start? Like tomorrow? And I was like, no, no, no. Like I got, like, I'm traveling. I'm going to be back on Wednesday. Let's talk on Wednesday, which was like four or five days away. Fatal mistake. Classic 34 year old mistake thinking that, that the world's not going to change in four days. This guy's entire, he, in those four days, he ends up launching an NFT project that goes super viral, ends up making so much money. He goes and becomes this anonymous account, Frank D Gods. And, <laughs> exactly he, this is. <laughs> and, and he created the D Gods project. I can talk about it now because he's like out publicly. But for a while, I was like, what the fuck is this? And so I kept trying to hit him up, be like, what happened? I didn't know he was the guy behind D Gods. And so I was like, dude, what? You ghosting me? Like, we, we were, we had such a good idea. He's like, hey, man, like three weeks later, he just resurfaced. He's like, Sorry, bro. Like, like it, just, it was like no time had passed between our conversations. It's like, oh yeah, about that. Um, I don't know, man. I, I <laughs> now I'm doing this other stuff. I got to do this. And I was like, tell me about it. So he he screen shares and he shows me how he's growing it. And one thing I'll never forget that was like the classic. Like, this is this guy's an idiot. This makes no sense. But I I'm down and I'm I want to be in this car. Um, and so I, <laughs> he shows me the site. And I go, how do you stop people from just selling it like, you know, right away? Like, what, what are you getting? Because nothing holds value unless the the people who buy it hold. It was just why, like, for Bitcoin, the genius meme is the, the hold old meme, right? Because it became culturally the normal thing to do to just hold the thing. And he goes, oh, yeah, I had the same thought. So I created something called the paper hands bitch tax. And I go, what? He goes, <laughs> Basically, if you sell at a loss, if you sell for less than the mint price, not only do you get just like, you know, you take the loss on the principal, but we also apply a 25% tax because you had paper hands and we applied the bitch tax to you for selling on the, on the dip. <laughs> and I was like, he's like, people loved it. And I was like, what the fuck? And it totally, it totally worked. It became like, again, he, he created a meme and, it, and it, it, it was a monetized meme in his case. And I just thought it was awesome. So yeah, I, I'm oh, totally dude. down to uh, hang out with these guys. Sean, while all this was happening, uh, I just looked at my DMs. So I have like a, another perspective on uh, the exact same situation, which was uh, one of the hacks that people have figured out is if they post something on their Instagram story, like a lot of times people with bigger audiences will just like share it. But in the DMs, it looks like they like messaged you. So now there's like, they posted something, then you posted something. And so he did that and he... <laughs> Uh, he posted something, I reposted it. And then he followed up with, he's going to kill me for reading this out loud. He goes, if you have any ideas for some more fun tools for us to make that you think would be helpful, would love to chat, man. And he said it like we were like boys, right? Like, <laughs> like he just like, was kind of like saying it like, of course, like you're going to engage. So I didn't respond. I, maybe I didn't see it or whatever. And so I guess I went to LA uh, for the Super Bowl, And then he follows it up with, yo, we got to kick it while you're out here. <laughs> like, like again, like we're like boys. And I'm like, who is this like 20 something year old kid, right? And so then he just keeps messaging me until finally in July, he just starts DMing me things and he just keeps saying, yo. And so I met him in person <laughs> in Miami and I was like, who are you basically? And he's like, oh, I'm into Bitcoin or whatever, but like, I have this secret to tell you. And he told me about the <laughs> NFT thing. And I was like, what is going on? And he was showing up to conferences with like uh, handkerchiefs over his face. Right. And like completely <laughs> I saw that guy. his identity. And I was just like, do you understand how you cannot have like any degree of success or uh, <laughs> reputation or anything to be willing to like go to the lengths of success that he went to? And I think that's why like young people are so empowering to be around. It's just like that kid was willing to do a bunch of stuff, no matter how cool we think the three of us are. We would never do 50%, 60% of the things that he did because we're like, ah, I can't do the paper hand bitch tax because then everyone's gonna like, pump, <laughs> fuck you, you know, like like yelling and screaming or whatever. And this kid's just like, dude, this would be hilarious. Watch this, do, 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 right. implement and it works. 
And so I don't know. It's just like, how do we find more of those? If you're like a young kid who has a idea of like, well, paper hand bitch tax, please DM us. I'll tell you, I'll tell you where I, where I messed up. So I had met, I think, I think I told story. I've told stories in the pod about like four people like this. I basically had four people that I kind of like either did hire or were trying to hire as like a ju really junior kind of like intern mentor type type situation that have all gone on to become like multimillionaires done super in interesting things. And I was like, how do I have more of this young energy in my life? Because these people are awesome. They're flawed for sure. They do a lot of dumb shit, but the <laughs> things they do do are all, it's always interesting. It's never boring, right? It's like, you know, it's reality TV in a way to me. So I'm like, all right, I want to be, I, I don't want to just get older. And as you become more successful, you start hanging out with older and older people, then you become old. And so I'm like, no, no, no I'm trying to fight that. So I did this dumb thing, which was I tried to recruit. I tried to like put out the call for people like this. I was like, Hey, if you're young, you're smart. Uh, you know, like joint, like, you know, I just want to hang with you. I'll invest in your stuff or I don't know. I'll mentor you. I'll do something. I put out a type form and I got all these smart people applying, but they were all the wrong people because I had done it in a way that was like, it was like the high achiever path. It was like, here's an admission form. And they're like, ah, a test. I know how to win the, I know how to apply for things and get picked and be like, and so they just said all the, the the right sounding things, which was, here's my background. Here's my pedigree. They're well-spoken. And I recruited like 20 of the wrong people. And I just had to like abandon ship. I was like, okay, I need to find a way to get like the shitheads. And the like, yeah, they, they're, they're the wrong type of nerd. Exactly. Like I don't want high achiever nerd. That's used to ticking all the boxes and getting good scores on all the standardized, uh, standardized tests and, you know, getting picked for the, 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 like the, the thing that their parents wanted them to do or school wants them to do. It's like, you need the person who's gone off the path, you know, will in the bathroom at target, you know, <laughs> who's tweeting out like reckless Bitcoin stats and shit like that. Like you need, you need somebody who's a little bit off the path. Uh, because they're the ones who do more interesting things. And so I don't know. I haven't figured out how to recruit that except for um, like referral. Basically, I'm Dude, like, it, who do you uh, hang out with? It, it's Marshawn Lynch. Yeah, like his famous quote of like, uh, I'm about that action boss. I'm or all whatever, about that right? action boss. Yeah. yeah. And like, uh, there's a young person I know. I, I won't use his name or, or what he built, uh, but people may be able to figure it out. Um, he, I think he like moved to Miami or something uh, or like was visiting Miami maybe. Uh, and I saw him on Twitter. He was like tweeting some interesting things. I just DM'd him. I was like, like basically like, what's your deal? Right. And uh, similar to Sam's like, let's fuck. I was just like, you know, like, what's your deal? And no, I, I, I usually say, what, what's your story? Tell me your story. Sam the let's fuck is for friends. When, when I was in Austin, we were texting and he was like, uh, should we do dinner? And I responded with let's fuck. And, and, he, <laughs> and he was like, God damn it. <laughs> um, but so this kid, he like comes to the office and I don't know, he's probably like early twenties and he's literally like, yeah. So me and my friend, we like built this app and it's been downloaded 75 million times. <laughs> it's like making like millions of dollars. And I was like, what are you doing? Like, like he's like, yeah, I'm going to like figure out a new thing to do. And I was like, well, what about the thing that's working? And he's like, oh, it's like on autopilot. Like I'm going to like figure out this new thing. And I was just like, man, you are so cool. I hope that you are so successful. We need like a hundred thousand of you in the world because he literally could care less about the money and like all that stuff. He just was like, how do we build cool shit? And so I was like, man, imagine if one of us had built an app that had 75 million downloads, we'd be talking about it nonstop. Like that'd be our main- I'd retire. <laughs> yeah. Ben, update like my LinkedIn. <laughs> 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 Endorse my skill. <laughs> Dude, I have the craziest version of the story. I know we're way over, but I got to tell the story. It's, it's too good. So that guy, Rohan, I'm like, how do I meet more people like him? So my strategy was, let me just hang out with him. And I told him, bring a friend. So he drives from LA down to San Diego to where we're hanging out at this house and he brings a friend. Of course, the friend is, you know, the 24 year old version of the Dos Equis guy. He's the most interesting man in the world. So this guy comes in and I'm like, all right, what's your deal? Guy who like, you know, has curly hair and maybe still has pimples. Like, you know, you must be the best. And he of course was the best. So he, he's like, yeah, my name's Luca. And I'm like, what's your story? And he goes, so I went in reverse order because he brought in these guns, like these, uh, uh, nerf type guns, like gel blasters. I don't know if you've seen this, but like the gun called the gel blaster, it's basically like, um, they're everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. Now I didn't realize it's like, this. It, it, it's like a $50 million a year business. So he basically was like, Oh, right now I'm working on this like DTC product. This like, you know, thing. Oh yeah. We just, we're in Walmart's nationwide or whatever, you know, like, I don't know some, some shit like that. Where basically it's like, 
if you're 13 years old, years old, this is your like number one thing you want for Christmas is like this. It's kind of like less painful than a paintball gun, but like cooler than a Nerf gun where it's just a foam thing. It's like this little pellet. That's like a gel pellet and it shoots like a machine gun. So already he brought two over the party became way more fun. People are shooting each other. It's great. So I'm like, all right, you're doing this. That's crazy. He's like, yeah, you know, I was trying to do this, but then we got ripped off. We got sued by this one thing, blah, blah, blah. I was like, all right, what'd you do before this? He goes, oh yeah, I'm into crypto. That's why I know, you know, why I know you guys, you know, um, I bought pudgy penguins. So he did like a hostile takeover slash buyout of pudgy penguins, this NFT project, which again, it's not what you're, it's, you know, you don't usually think I'm going to go spend millions of dollars to buy pudgy penguins, NFT IP. <laughs> but he decided that that was a good use of time. I said, how'd you get millions of dollars? And he goes, well, before that, I um, I started this online e-commerce brand where I was selling gold chains, you know, like wrappers, gold chains and grills and shit like that. And I go, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I just like, I just realized that you could just buy these like kind of crazy blinged out wrapper gold chains and like, uh, and I sold them. And then I sold my company to this company shop GLD, which, uh, which does like 300, 400 million a year. I was like, 300 or 400 million. I've seen these people like sponsor, you know, like kind of like, you know, random Instagram influencers. So I'm like, wow, this is all crazy. I go, but how'd you get started doing that? And I got one level deeper. He goes, well, I, um, I had to like, you know, for family reasons, you know, me and my mom were like homeless for a couple of years and I had to like, Oh my God. I, he's like, I just quit school in high school and I had to go make money. So I went down uh, the street and I started knocking on doors, trying to get a job. I got rejected everywhere. The last door I knocked on was a startup called ring. And the guy, Jamie was, was there as a tiny office. And he's like, who are you? What do you need? He's like, I need a job badly, like to pay, help pay like for family stuff. Uh, I'll do anything. And he's like, okay, well, I got like, I got to box up all these orders. Can you just help me with that? And so he like started boxing up the orders. He was like the first employee at ring. And then was like with Jamie for a few years before going off and doing his own thing. And I was like, and now he, he's and now he's your son. So this was all before him. like 25, he was like 24, 25 when I met this guy, uh, you know, a couple months ago. And I'm like, you have lived three lifetimes in, in, in of career epicness and just really interesting things. Like, I can't wait to see what this guy's going to do next. But like that, Dude, to me, that to me is the future, right? Is like all these young people who have that skill set. It's not for everyone. Like some people just want to go be the accountant or go be, you know, kind of a mid-level manager and that's their career aspiration. That's fine. Um, but for the people who want to do this, like that guy literally knows more about business and like IP and, you know, uh, physical store distribution and like all these things than most people coming out of MBA schools, totally. right? Like good for that kid. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And I was like, "Hey, uh, I'm trying to think about influencers." And I just, I literally felt like someone being like, uh, "Like it's like if some, it's like when my grandfather comes to me." Yeah, he's they're, like, they're they're gonna start calling you Gray Bush. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's like <laughs> it's like I've helped my grandfather like set up Facetime, you know, just so he can see his grandkids, and it's like, uh, yeah. and it's like. Uh, I don't know. Just push the green button. Like that's all. That's as far as you're gonna get here. Like that's how I felt by the end of talking to this guy about how to like how to do online marketing through like influences on Instagram. Like by the end of it, he was like, you know what? Just like send me the link, dude. I'll take care of it for you. <laughs> you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to do this stuff, <laughs> dude. That's crazy. These are these are some good stories. I'm 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 back. The energy's back, baby. <laughs> okay, should, we good, just, you know, should we just go forever? Like, just do like a <laughs> ten hour rip. And see this what would happens. be well, like thirty percent of Pomp's morning show. He would still be sitting there with his brothers. Dude, and we still can talk have like two hours show? of airtime to fill. You want to know the craziest part about the morning show? Is the greatest thing I ever did and the worst thing I ever did because it took so much time. To your point, but man. There is no better thing than just hanging out. Like, imagine if we every single day just live streamed for two hours <laughs> about whatever the fuck was going on. You had never had more fun than doing stuff like that. <laughs> the problem is you start to just say what's actually on your mind and like <laughs> you get a little make loose. Look real dumb <laughs> well, later. <laughs> one time I was on one time I was on your show and I like totally ruined it for your sponsor. Do you remember that? No, what'd you do? I think you had SoFi on as like a sponsor. Yeah. And I, 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 uh, like something wasn't going well with them. And I was like, so five, more like, so fucked. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I saw your face, that. I saw your face freak out and I go, Oh wait, so five marketing people. If you're listening to this, this is me, Sam. I'm saying this, not pomp. So don't, don't yell at him. Dude, you they, guys suck or something. They, they were incredible. And, uh, it was like, they had the stadium and the whole thing. 
But like, you know how it is, right? There's probably people who have said things about sponsors or like maybe a company you're an investor in or whatever. And you're always like, and I wish you hadn't said that, but like, here we go. And that was definitely one of those moments where I was just like, well, there's a lot worse things that Sam could have said. So like, <laughs> I guess on the grand scale of like what is possible, that was like not great, but still, you know, we'll just keep moving here. Well, so, well Sam, I made Sam's sure I, I remember I, you, I, I talked to him. Go, sorry, go ahead. You, you've got the, the Donald Trump thing where it's like, if you're crazy from the beginning, if you just say wild shit all the time, there's no penalty. It's only like, Pomp, you, you're a little too smart and like responsible. If you slip up even a little, people are going to get on you. But like, if you're just wild all the time, there is no penalty. You somehow get out of jail free. And I think I, I've been trying to steal that from Sam now of uh, how, to, how to just keep it, keep it loose. And somehow like Sam does it to guests. They'll come on and be like, you know, you're really good looking for like an ugly tech guy. <laughs> like, like they're already, their head spinning or he'll just be like... He'd be like, you're not rich, but you got a little bit of money. And they're just like, what did she say to me? Sean, you'll appreciate this whenever people- uh, Nagged them. No, whenever people are like, hey, uh, I want to start a podcast. And I'm like kind of talking through with them for a few minutes in terms of like what to do. I use Sam as an example. So I'm like, well, you can have like, you know, a show where you just talk yourself, you can have like an interview show. And then like within those different categories, like, you know, you can have a, a really serious, intelligent podcast where you ask really smart questions. Uh, or you can be like really blunt, like, you know, Sam Parr, like he'll just have guests come on and just be like, how much money is in your bank account? <laughs> and then, so I always think of like, man, 50% of people are like, ah, I'm good. I'm not going to answer that. And then 50% like just literally tell you the answer. <laughs> and I'm like, what a genius way to get great content. It's just like, ask the questions that no one will answer. And then, then he'll follow up with something that's like, well, and the, the reason I ask is because, because I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, there was more justification, but there's just none. Because I'm always curious, like, you know, I, I've been following you for years and I just, I was always curious, like, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, like, in that book, Influence, they say they say if you if you if you give someone a reason for why you're doing something, they're more likely to do it. Right. And so I got in the habit of saying like, yeah, and I'm asking that because I'm curious. Right. It doesn't matter what comes after because, <laughs> yeah, because it's just a magic word. All right. Can I, can I ask you guys one question before we uh, before we break here? Yeah. Can each of you point who's the one person that's like on the internet. So not like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or, or Jeff Bezos or whatever. Who's like the one internet entrepreneur that you're like, man, that person seems to have figured it out. And like, I can't wait to see what they continue to do over the next 20, 30 years. And like mm -hmm. extra points if it's somebody that no one really knows. My obvious one is Huber, but Nick Huber. But let me think about, let me think about. Wait, uh, why is that uh, obvious? Uh, I don't think that would have been obvious. Well, why is that obvious? Well, I, I, everyone knows them. Um, I also think that um, if I had to bet money on like one operator, um, I think it would be Austin Reef at Morning Brew. Like I've gotten to know him really well, and he's one of the few people he's where I'm like, uh, I'm like afraid of him. Like yeah. if I hears that I'm gonna compete with them, I would be like, shit, it's on. So he, 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 I would say those two. But let me try to think of someone who's a little bit more anonymous. What about you, Sean? Let me ask you a different question, Pomp, before I answer. What would be the what would be the type of answer that would be interesting to you here? Is it just somebody who like either nobody knows or somebody who's been like successful doing something that isn't like oh, I set up a newsletter and now I have a bunch of like ad revenue. Like yeah. the the pellet gun, you know, is like fascinating, right? You're just like, man, who even knew that was a market? So like somebody who's out, uh, kind of out of the mainstream. All right, here's one. We have this, we both have a friend, but I'm going to hurry up and say it so Sean doesn't. There's a guy named Mark Jenny um, <laughs> who started this company called RV Share and he sold it for hundreds of millions of dollars. Now he owns like $50 million worth of Airbnbs. And we'll like message him like, hey, do you want to come on the pod? He's like, oh, I can't. For the next three months, I'm traveling the world with my kids and their homeschool, their homeschooling teacher. Talk later. And uh, he uh, I think he's he's kind of one of the guys who I look at who's just kind of one life. And, then, and the last one is the guy who started um, WP uh, Forms. What's it called, Sean? His, Saeed. It's called Saeed. Uh, he started um, this company that owns maybe a hundred million dollar years, a hundred million dollar a year business where he owns all these WordPress forms and he or WordPress plugins. And he says he works five days a week. So one day a week, one day a month or one week a month, he takes the meetings with all of his CEOs. And then besides that, he's giving away a lot of his money and he's like 30 years old, married with kids, super low key. Oh, that's a great answer. Sean, I'll give you a couple of names that come to mind. So I think, um, so Amjad from Replit, 
I think he's sitting on a monster business that is kind of hidden in plain sight. Like people know about it, but it's not yet considered to be big just because they haven't come out with a really flashy headline of being worth X billions of dollars. Like I think when they raised their last round, it was at uh, almost like strategically shy of a billion number. It was like 800 and something million instead of a billion. Um, I'm sure they could have negotiated it up, but I actually really like that he didn't. And it's one of these things that's just like, I think it's a, I think it's just going to be a really important company. And I think it's going to be different than, uh, um, I think it's going to be different than the the previous winners looked like because, you know, like what happens is, uh, you know, Amazon takes off. Then you think the next big thing is going to be e-commerce, but no, it's actually Google. Then Google takes off. Then you think the next thing is going to be search and information. No, it's actually Facebook. It starts off as like a college social network thing. Then you think Facebook's the big thing. And then actually turned out to be Uber. It was like, you know, Uber and Airbnb was like real world shit that you can use your phone as a magic button to do. So it's kind of like the next interesting thing is not going to look like what the last interesting things look like. And I think that uh, what Replit is, which is this like coding environment for oftentimes beginners, teenagers, um, I think is like a stealth, really, really big deal. Uh, but it's kind of boring. So I wouldn't say like, I wouldn't say he's the one I'm looking at because I kind of know what he's going to do for the next 10 years. I almost don't have to look. It's like, I, I could just check in in 10 years and be like, yep, the hockey step, the hockey stick kept going. And like, you know, obviously that, that had big implications. Well, um, I'm, an inve- I'm an investor in Replit. And I think that you're spot on of like, it's way bigger than people realize. But also uh, the most important thing is like, they capture new coders and then they try to keep them in that environment. And right. so like, if they get you early on, it's like kind of like going to like Lifetime. the source yeah, it's just like that's your lifetime infrastructure. It's a fascinating business. I'm an idiot and should have invested so much more money because uh, I completely agree. It's going to be a massive, massive company. So who are your other ones, Sean? Uh, the other ones, so I would have said a couple of years ago, Sam Altman, but now I think that's obvious. So I'm going to say somebody who I think is on par with Sam Altman, but doesn't have the same shine and doesn't have the clear like open AI type of like interesting bet, which is Daniel Gross. So Daniel Gross is one of the more most interesting and impressive people that I've met. Um, I think that he fits your category because he's still young enough. He's ambitious, super, super ambitious like Sam Altman, but he's free. He's not like currently committed to like one company for like a really long time or like in the middle or, you know, hasn't like picked one path that he has to stay in. And so I just can't imagine that in the next 10 years, Daniel Gross doesn't do something that is like just epic. Uh, and I think it could be in some field that you don't, that maybe he's not even working in today. It could be like longevity or some biohacking thing. So I think that you need people who are willing to go into these other spaces that pull off some impressive shit. I think bio, bio and like sort of this longevity space is really interesting. And there's going to be some tech entrepreneur that's like, forget, like, you know, forget the newsletter, podcast, Twitter, forget software with VCs, forget investing. I'm going to go and do something else with my time. And I I like people who just choose to play their own game and ideally a game that not everybody else is playing. I think Daniel Gross is going to be that guy. That's a great one. And and he is kind of like hidden in plain sight, but I think that Sam was at the same time. Like he came on our podcast really early on, like at the hustles office. He's, I don't even know how we got him on. We just, I don't even know who knows him. Maybe me or you, Sam, I don't remember, but he just walked in. I don't think he had any idea what we were doing. I'm pretty sure we like shared a microphone. Like we did the thing where you're like, I think we were on our iPhone. I'm going to pass it to you. Like we were down, definitely down one mic. <laughs> it's like, cause we only had ever done two people uh, episodes. It was this tiny room and we're we sitting at like, this uh, AirPods. little table. Like you, 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 you know, like it looks like lunchable should be on top of the table. Like it was that baby of a table. And our show is not for everybody. It's not like you could sit down. Most people be like, Cool. Let's brainstorm. Like, what's what's an interesting startup idea you have? What what are some spaces you think are cool? Why do you think this is going to work? And this guy was able to riff for like two hours on everything from like running to why somebody should create a new Apple competitor with creating a new laptop to his investing strategy and why it's different, like how he's going to beat YC, all these different topics. And he just went for like two hours effortlessly. And I thought, okay, that's impressive. That's you know the type of person I, I like to follow and be around. But is is that like a signal? you actually should surround yourself with one young people, but two is like the most interesting people you can find. Like I hate going to dinner. Sam and I were talking about this uh, when we went to dinner. Like I hate going to like the classic business dinner where everyone's like, oh, what do you do? What's going on at work? Whatever. (laughs) Like I love the person who shows up to dinner and they have some wild thing 
that makes everyone disagree and argue and, and like, uh, uh, debate what's going to happen and this and that and whatever. And then you find like the person who has that usually has like a whole bag of them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like, like they literally are like, Oh, okay. We're done talking about this one. Like here's my next, you know, ace out of my back pocket. And those people somehow always figure out how to be successful. Like very rarely do you find the like most interesting man, kind of like the kid with the gun, right? That ends up not figuring it out. They may fail a hundred times, but eventually they do it. And is that just like they think differently and that is kind of the prerequisite to actually finding true success? Yeah, independent mindedness. Like Jack Smith was the other guy I was going to say because he's like this. I don't know, Pop, do you know Jack? No, who's that? He's uh, Jack Smith. He started Vungle, which was like a big ad network. Um but he's a kind of young British guy who is. I don't he know, sold that company for nine hundred million dollars when he was twenty eight years old. And Ooh. and so he, but but like, if you talk to him, he'll never mention it because it's not because he's being humble. Like he is humble, but it's because it's just not interesting to him. I don't know even know if it was interesting. He left like a few years before it sold because he's like, cool, I'm going to do whatever. And anytime you talk to Jack, he's up to a new, as Sam would call it, a new caper. And it's like, uh, it's not like usually for profit. Like sometimes it's for profit, but it's more like, dude, Jack, you don't care about this money. He's like, but I'm trying to beat this game. And so like one time you'll talk to him and he'll be like, he spent the last two months in his garage trying to build the perfect computer chair. It's like the, like, like the thing is zero gravity, like floating on your back chair. And he tried every product. He's tinkering with it until he gets it right. And the next time you talk to him, he's like, really into the world of collectibles. And he's like, got this arbitrage going where he's buying and selling baseball cards. And you're like, Sam, uh, you're like, Jack, do you even know about baseball? He's like, couldn't tell you the first thing about baseball, but I could tell you that this card right here is undervalued. And my like team in the Philippines is like flipping them right now for profit. Then the next time or he, he, made, to him, he, he made, he, he made like a list where he put in a spreadsheet, all the companies that you can buy a pair, a pair of clothing from, and you could return it within 365 days. He was like, <laughs> I want to see if I can like live for free for a year off these clothes, off this clothing and return it. Or, you know, just like weird schemes. He just or, loves or like, or like he, he had a baby and then he didn't name the baby. They just called it baby <laughs> for the first year until the baby could pick its own name by crawling to like one of the names. I was like, this guy's not going to do anything in the like just standard version and he's not doing any of these. Like he's not talking about them. We are the ones who talk about them. Maybe he doesn't even want to, maybe we should take that out. But like, he doesn't do it for the effect. Like he just does it. Cause he just got curious about that path or wanted it to like, just thought that makes more sense to him than the other way. And then he'll do it. And he's not like, what you don't want is the guy who's at the dinner to immediately say the crazy thing. Cause they're like trying to seem a little bit out there and like, they're trying to build their brand. Like that's the worst. You want the person who's almost aloof to the fact that it sounds batshit crazy. And you're like, dude, do you realize what you're saying? And they're like, what, what's wrong with that? Well, the, by the way, the baby thing was like the, I, I made fun of, I go, Jack, for once in your life, be normal. And then, um, like I, I, you know, like the time passed and I was like, that's actually a great idea. Cause he said, he goes, why would I name my kid before I even know them? I should like see like what type of name right. fits. And I was like, Oh yeah, you're actually right. It is weird that like we don't get to know them. Uh, and so anyway, he does things all the times where at first glance I'm like, this is the stupidest thing ever. Just be normal for once, and then he'll uh, he'll like I I actually think he's right a lot of times. But I, th I I think that there's like somebody who has that proclivity of like always doing things in a different way. One, it isn't necessarily different to them, but two is that those individuals are the ones who actually end up figuring out like what is the best chair or they're the one who like they'll convince a whole friend group to like not name their kids for a year or you know what I mean? Like there's almost this like lack of uh, importance we put on uh, the courage to be different. So like even in friend groups, like do you ever notice like everyone thinks something and then once one person says uh, something else, then a bunch of people like flip and they're almost <laughs> like just like kind of like oh, wh where's the magnet, right? Like, right. oh, this viewpoint is popular. Like they just kind of mosey on over here. And then like, oh, this other person said this, they mosey on over there. And so I do think that we need those people in a society, but also like, man, what a boring friend group it would be to have where like everyone just gets together on Friday night. And like, what'd you do this week? I don't know. Went to work. Right. Right. Like, wh what are you doing this weekend? Like, I don't know. Gonna like just watch the games. Like it, it just would not be fun. And so I think that a lot of people who listen to this podcast, but also just like are quote unquote on the internet, they're escaping what could be like their local life of that. 
and they're trying to find other interesting people. They're trying to find other ideas and it's like exhilarating for them. And so like this Jack guy sounds amazing, but like, how do you find a hundred of them? Well, it's usually you, you find one and though. then you just realize that they're going to do this forever. Like there's this one Russian guy who started this social network back in the day called Koob. I don't know if you ever saw it, but like Koob was TikTok before TikTok. It was amazing. It was only in Russia, Ukraine. Um, I only found out about it because I randomly met up with this group from Ukraine that was touring the touring Silicon Valley. And I was like, hey, come to our office. I'll give you a talk. And I at the end, I asked them, I was like, what's the hot shit in Ukraine that I should be knowing about? I don't even know why I asked this question. It turned out to be a great question, but I didn't really expect them to have a good answer. But they're like, this thing called Koob blowing up. And this was like two years before TikTok. And um, and so anyways, he built that thing. It, it, it didn't end up going huge, I think, because of other reasons, like with Russia and the way they control things. But uh, I'm like, this guy's going to always do interesting things. So last week I checked in. I was like, what's that guy Anton doing? Of course, he's doing the craziest shit. So he now is doing, he's like, <laughs> I'm trying to change the way people eat fruit. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> he's like, you ever seen someone eat a mango, cut a mango? It's disgusting. I go, what? He goes, the way Americans eat mangoes is terrible. A mango is, so, he's like, it just goes on this, he's like, mangoes are beautiful. They're the most delicious thing. And he has basically, he did this, he has some process that cuts like the juiciest part of a mango into a perfect little ball. And so you get, you look at it, you're like, that looks delicious. And basically his mission is to make fruit more fun and delicious to eat by just cutting it better. And you cut it better and you package it that way. You, you, you store it in a certain way. And he's like, I'm going to reinvent the way people eat fruit. And I'm like, of course you are. Of course, guy who created TikTok two years before TikTok is now going to change the way I eat like mango. But like, you know, sure enough, like he's going to just keep doing interesting things. He can't not. That's an investment Dude. thesis. Weird shit that makes money. It's amazing. Pomp, you were messaging me before this and you're like, it's only an hour, right? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, give or take. And uh, give or take an hour. Uh, this is now our longest episode ever, I think. Hopefully you didn't miss any meetings. We're going to we're gonna break this up into two episodes, I think. I think we have to. Two episodes? I think. I think because the first thing was awesome and the second thing was uh, was awesome. This is a, I don't want people to miss the, the second half. The second half was maybe better than the first half. Well, you guys are too kind. I uh, I listen every week. I always enjoy listening to you guys give each other shit and then having the guests. Who's funnier? <laughs> well, see, the whole thing about humor is that you guys have your moments, but I just enjoy <laughs> what, I enjoy when the uh, when the guests come on, and then you both you can just feel it. Like uh, one time, I heard uh, Joe Rogan and Naval on uh, on their podcast, and I said to my wife, I was like, "Man, Joe Rogan's super smart, but like this is like a Ferrari and a Corolla." <laughs> you know, like literally like Nepal was just like, he was like hitting his A game. Right. And even Joe was just kind of like, Hmm, tell me more. <laughs> like he just had nothing to, to really go. And, uh, sometimes like I feel you guys are like, man, you guys are just absolutely killing it. And then a guest comes on you're like, Hmm, tell me more. <laughs> and you just let them ride. So I appreciate all the work you guys are doing. And, uh, you give me a little, something to listen to every morning. Sam, the funnier guy is the one who didn't have to ask who's funnier. Just so you know. <laughs> The general rule. <laughs> it's better than you. I don't know, me, man. Uh, who's uglier? Which, uh, which I'm sure is the next question. I don't know, man. I get texts. I get at least one text a month saying I'm a hilarious. Have you guys done the analysis of who talks more? Him. It's got to be me. I don't have. Yeah, is it? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure some somebody in the audience probably could do it. And then you can argue. It's, it's that him. Too. Yeah. They so did something we don't even need data science. We don't need Will Clemente at Target to know this one. <laughs> yeah. Talk and, and interrupt more. Uh, dude, Pop, this is great. Uh, what were you saying? You were saying that everybody should subscribe to our channel or they're going to lose all their money or something like that. Something, what was the agreement? The gentleman's agreement. If you don't fulfill the gentleman's agreement, like what's going on? Come on. The, the gentleman's agreement and the ladies' understanding. The ladies' well, understanding. Exactly. What, what you guys should start telling people is like, help me help you, you know, is uh, mm. just Jerry the McGuire. subscribe. Yeah, get the uh, get the video in the feed. Now that uh, Susan, CEO of uh, YouTube, has stepped down, Neil has stepped in. He's bringing back all the distribution. He's going to send you guys to the moon. So don't uh, don't worry. I wish I could uh, be on a first name basis with these people. <laughs> I mean, well, the, it's the like what are you like a what are you you're like a called Dave Matthews Band Dave too. <laughs> well, the the beauty is you just call them by their first name, and then they similar to Rohan DMing me. You just think that you're boys, and so I'm hoping that maybe they'll uh, turn our volume up a little bit on YouTube if uh, he Yo, hears this. Oh, Susan, Susan, <laughs> Neil, Wait, can I tell you guys actually a really funny story very quickly? Uh, oh, what is um, what is the guy who uh, 
he used to walk around with, with uh, the clock. What is that guy's name? Flavor uh, the big Flav? Flavor Flav. Flavor Flav. So uh, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I, I'm like almost 99.9% .9 sure it was him. Uh, I was working at Facebook. Joe Montana came to like do like this veterans event. And so they need like an escort, kind of like a, almost like a babysitter for any guest who comes on campus. So another guy was going to take Joe Montana and they were like, hey, you uh, are going to go with Flava Flav. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. Like, okay. So I'm like <laughs> walking around with him, kind of like nervous to talk to him because he's, you know, like a celebrity, but also like, is he cool? Is he not? Whatever. Do the event. And at the end he goes, yo, before I leave, where's that Instagram dude at? And I was like, what? And he was like, <laughs> the Instagram dude. And I was like, uh, and he was like, the Instagram guy, where is he? I know he works here. And I was like, <laughs> do you mean like the founders? And he was like, yeah, the tall one. I met him. I know him. And I was like, oh boy. <laughs> and so he was like, I was like, uh, Kevin. And he was like, uh, yeah, that one. So I'm like, I genuinely, I generally know where the Instagram team sits. So I like walk through the whole campus, right? We get there and I'm like, please don't be at your desk. Please don't be at your desk. Please don't be at your desk. Right. Never talked to the guy before. And then, uh, sure enough, he's like there, he's like taller than everybody. You can see him the second you walk in the door and I got Flavor Flav with me and I walk over and I go, uh, excuse, excuse me, Kevin, uh, uh, Flavor Flav says he knows you. Mr. Flav. Mr. Flav. He'd like to say hi. And Kevin turns and he's like, oh man, what's up? Like whatever. And he's like super nice to him. And Flavor Flav just goes, what's up? Yo, you need to turn my volume up on Instagram. <laughs> 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 and I'm like, I'm definitely being fired. Like, holy shit, this is so bad. And uh, and Kevin was like a consummate professional. He's like, let me go like introduce you to our partnerships team, like blah, 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 whatever. <laughs> and I remember like on my way out, I was like, hey man, sorry about that. Like, did you know him? He was like, I think we met like one time, like five years ago at a party, but like, sure. <laughs> and so I always just think about like, yeah, if you ever get to talk to the leaders of any of these products, like that's the question that you got to ask. got to shoot your shot. It's like, yo, turn, turn my volume, my volume up. up. That's so good. <laughs> that's that's so my new good. phrase. <laughs> that and do I look like a guy with a plan? That those, <laughs> <laughs> those are just, those are just epic. All right, fellas. Appreciate it.